Tell us a little bit about what you do. <laughs> so I'm a partner with BST. Um, I think I pretty much know everybody on. So I run our, our virtual accounting solutions, our outsourced uh, division, and uh, work with clients on outsourced CFO services, as well as controllership and you know general accounting services. All right. So today we're talking about the challenges of reopening and, and Kristen and I are going to talk about, you know, different aspects of it. Um, I'll be coming at it from an HR standpoint and uh, Kristen's going to kind of take it from the HR uh, to compliance to some of your financial and documentation concerns. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time today going through chapter and verse of your safety plans and all the kinds of things that you need to do. Hopefully folks, if you're reopening your business, you've already got those done. So no reason to rehash those. But what we wanted to talk about was maybe, or what I wanted to talk about from an HR perspective, are some of the, I would call softer skills around reopening. So you've got all of your compliance requirements. This doesn't just sit in the HR department. If you're doing this right, all of your managers need to understand what's required in order to bring employees back. What's inquired, what's required of them when an employee comes forward and says, hey, you know, my daycare just closed. Hey, I've got to be home to, um, you know, take care of a kid. Hey, um, you know, I think I was just exposed um, and the county wants me to quarantine. These are the kinds of things that we wanted to kind of mention today. So, you know, as you're reopening, Make sure that you have very clearly communicated your plans to your employees. The best, one of the fastest ways to get into trouble with staff is to be inconsistent in implementing any policy, but especially around all of the uh, coronavirus stuff. What, what we're seeing is a lot of employers where somebody will come in and say, oh, hey, didn't they go to Virginia over the weekend? Shouldn't they be quarantining? What are they doing here? So the friction begins almost immediately before people really understand you know, anybody's individual situation. So managers have a big role here, a huge role. And it's department managers that are interacting with their staff on a daily basis. They need to get out there and they need to be talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. They need to do it frequently. And I'm, I'm not just talking about every day, I'm talking about several times during the day. And, and be looking at employees' overall physical well-being and overall health. You have all the things that you're doing in the workplace for social distancing and PPEs and hand sanitizing and all those kinds of things. But remember that all of your employees are bringing all kinds of stress and, and life pressure with them when they come to work. Again, you know, do they have kids at home that don't have school, don't have daycare? Are they doing split shifts with a spouse or, or another caregiver? Um, you know, you don't know what kind of challenges they're facing until you sit and talk with them. And once your employees trust you enough to open up to you a little bit, now you have the opportunity to start helping them find resources to help solve some of these problems. So you want to provide a, a healthy work environment that includes the physical plant. So again, all those things you need to be doing, the social distancing, the, the PPEs and all of that. You also need to be monitoring interpersonal relationships. Not only do we have coronavirus, but now we have all of the racial tension that's occurred because of the George Floyd situation. You need to be monitoring those interactions. A lot of what goes on today, especially when people can hide behind the keyboard and start flame throwing on social media, you know, Kristen and I could be having a conversation about a topic. I may have one view, she may have another. That doesn't make one of us right and one of us wrong. We just might have different, different views on the topic. So you'll need to coach people through how to handle those kinds of situations. Own how they're feeling without placing blame on somebody else. The other thing that from an HR perspective you need to be doing with all of the leaves that are out there now, all of the sick time that has to be paid and to certain employees under certain situations and so forth, record keeping is gonna be critical. So make sure your systems are set up so that you know why somebody's going out, how long they're going to be out, what's expected, and are they, are they out under a benefit program? Are they out under extended family medical leave? All of that stuff needs to be very well documented. Um, document the payments that you're making to folks. Communicate with your employees constantly about changes in your workplace, changes in your policy, um, and think about policy development. Think about what you're doing around things like disability, family medical leave, extended family medical leave, paid family leave. Um, and make sure you're protecting the rights of employees. Don't sit there and, and 
and say, well, you know what, let's not say anything. Maybe they won't take sick leave that we have to pay for. If you're proactive with employees and if you recognize a situation they're coming upon might fall under extended family and medical leave or COVID-19 sick leave or Families First Coronavirus Care Act sick leave, sit down with them, understand their situation, educate them. If employees think you're looking out for their best interests, if they think you're trying to protect their rights, you're gonna get a lot more cooperation out of your staff. You're gonna have much higher morale um, and people are gonna feel good about where they work, all right? Make sure confidentiality is maintained. And this is, this is gonna be hard for, for companies that are testing employees and doing um, thermal testing and all that kind of stuff before people walk in the door or people are out because they're quarantined or think they, or maybe they tested positive for COVID-19. You need to protect their confidentiality under HIPAA. It's critical, okay? And again, prepare your managers. Do they know what to look for? Your managers don't have to have all the answers. Your managers just have to know, hey, I better call HR, I need to get some help on this. It's okay to tell an employee you need to go get more information, but don't have them shoot from the hip, don't, don't have them guessing at what, what needs to be done. Okay, um, make sure you communicate your safety plan to everybody, ensure that your staff has an adequate supply of PPE. We saw early on in this crisis, all of the um, upset over hospitals, for example, that didn't have enough PPE and people reusing PPE and how upset they were about it. Make sure you've got enough to, to um, cover everybody. Ensure consistent enforcement of PPE use. If somebody starts you know, slipping that thing down under their nose or if they're wearing PPE on their chin but their mouth and their nose are exposed, you know, their chin's not gonna get anybody sick. I don't know how many of you see people doing that, you know, walking around the stores and everything else. I see it all the time. If you're consistent in the way you apply your policies, then you're not gonna have folks saying, well, geez, he didn't enforce it with that one, but he enforced it with this one. That's not fair, okay? You avoid all those problems when you're consistent. Proactively stay in touch with your managers. Even if they aren't coming to you, go to them, see what they need, uh, see what kind of questions they have, see what they're facing, see what issues people are bringing to them. Um, and again, review and recommunicate your policies on workplace safety, harassment. Again, people taking different views and different stances on coronavirus and race relations and everything else it can create conflict. Make sure people understand what harassment is and why it's against your policy. If you have a bullying policy, social media policies, workplace violence policies, clearly communicate uh, behavioral expectations on staff, train them on de-escalation, okay? Again, if people are really polarized around a topic, mature adults should be able to have a conversation. They may need coaching and help from you. And, all of this falls under, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I try to do a lot of reading. I probably don't do as much as I should, but there's two authors that come to mind as we're going through this. Um, first one is Stephen Covey. And if anyone's read his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that's starting to be old now in the, in the management lexicon. But one of the things he talks about is something he calls empathetic listening. And it's under habit number five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So when I, tell, when I say, you know, your managers need to be out there and proactively talking to people, finding out what's going on in their lives, finding out about the stresses they're bringing with them. Stephen Covey says, if you really seek to understand without hypocrisy and without guile, there will be times when you'll be literally stunned with the pure knowledge and understanding that will flow to you from another human being. All right. So your job as a manager is to get the best out of people, but that doesn't mean that you're out there just constantly pushing listen to what's going on in people's minds, listen to the stress that they're bringing with them. You may, be, sometimes they can, just having an ear to listen to um, can help quite a bit. I had a quote that I was gonna use a little later, but I'll use it now. Um, my daughter, when she was in high school, you know, being a typical father, you know, she'd come with a problem and I'd say, well, look, here's what we gotta do. We gotta go get this. We gotta go take this, get, you know, get this taken care of. Who do we call? Who do we speak to? And she looked at me and, her 15 years of worldly wisdom and said, Dad, sometimes I just need you to listen. I don't always need you to solve the problem for me. And I think that's a good lesson for managers, okay? Sometimes you just need to listen. Sometimes you just need to hear what's going on with folks and they appreciate the fact that you heard them. So 
Um, the other author I like is Simon Sinek. Um, and from his book, Leaders Eat Last, I have a couple of quotes. Um, because the true price of leadership is the willingness to place the needs of others above your own. Again, this is why you're listening to people, not telling them, not telling them your own issues, but listening to them. Great leaders truly care about those that they are privileged to lead and understand the true cost of the leadership privilege comes at the expense of self-interest. A close study of high-performing organizations, the ones in which people feel safe when they come to work, okay? So if you've got a manager who's looking out for you, who's asking you what's going on in your life, how can they help, you know, how can they protect your rights as an employee? How can they make sure you have access to the benefits that um, are, are, you know, that you're entitled to at work? You know, this is somebody that's making them feel safe when they come to work. And, and in those cultures, it reveals something astounding. Their cultures have an eerie resemblance to the conditions under which the human animal was designed to operate. If certain conditions are met and the people inside an organization feel safe among each other, they will work together to achieve things none of them could have ever achieved alone. But again, if you haven't addressed conflict that's going on, if people don't know how to do constructive problem solving, if people don't know how to have a conversation and solve problems between them, they're never gonna to get to this level. And the last quote from Simon Sinek, stress and anxiety at work have less to do with the work we do and more to do with weak management and leadership. When we know that there are people at work who care about how we feel, our stress levels decrease. So if people are coming to work, if people are stressed and they have a manager who cares, it's gonna help reduce their stress. So for managers, be visible at work. Don't just come into work, go in your office, close your door. Engage your staff. Numerous one-to-one uh, one -one conversations every day. Ask how folks are doing. What are the challenges or concerns they're facing? What are their questions? Gather information, listen for common themes, and then go get help from HR. You don't have to have all the answers, all right? And your communication with staff can't be sounding retaliatory, okay? Sometimes granting employees paid family leave, family medical leave, it's a pain in the neck. I had a client a couple years ago on any given day, over six to 8% of their workforce was out on some kind of family leave. That's a nightmare for managers trying to staff departments and so on, okay? It's inconvenient, but you have to help people. You have to let them know that you're concerned about their well-being. okay? How you communicate around this can be seen as helpful or it can sound retaliatory. And if it sounds retaliatory, then it's not a safe environment, then you're not getting the best out of people. So Kristen. Yes. I think that um, those are all really, really great points and very well taken. I know as we embark on reopening our firm with the over, you know, 100 plus employees that we have, it's been, you know, quite a challenge as to who needs to be there, who doesn't need to be there, who do we want to bring back, um, you know, from a, from a need standpoint, more so than a want standpoint. Um, and hopefully, you know, I think that one of the best things that has come out of this from my viewpoint, you know, running a virtual uh, outsourcing division is that a lot of people have now figured out that they can do more remotely than they really thought they could before. So, you know, this has been great for me. But in, in terms of the seminar for today, I mean, I... I think that the P, I did not put really PPP loans on the agenda for today because I think there are numerous PPP loan webinars out there and on forgiveness. If somebody has a question, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll, and we'll answer that. But you know, we're, we're for the most part into the forgiveness portion now. We have just about six days left to apply for a loan to get a loan regarding PPP. So I think, um, you know, we really should focus on forgiveness and hopefully the SBA will come out with the additional guidance that we need as quickly as possible. So hopefully we'll be able to, to kind of move forward with that as, and, and have the, they have now have an easy form and a regular form. Um, we also have the uh, New York State pass an emergency paid sick leave that will run through December 31st. There are different levels of, uh, of requirements for small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses as to who has to adhere to it and who doesn't. 
And I believe, you know, I know that Janine and Dave are both, you know, in the payroll world. They, you know, we've, we've had conversations with clients about, well, we need to create a special code, but we can't call it COVID pay because that might break a HIPAA violation if somebody were to see a paycheck stop, right? Because you can't keep that quiet now. So it, there is a little bit of a, of a confusion between what do you, what do you name things? What don't you name things? What can you have on your payroll? How do you, how do you go through and, and work through those credits that are out there and that, and the paid sick leave that go with it? Um, you really need to work hand in hand with your payroll company because they're all reported through the payroll. It's not something that will come through on a corporate income tax return at the end of the year. It needs to happen during the course of the year with each and every payroll or with the quarterly filings on the new IRS uh, 7200 form. So I think, you know, both, I know ADP from, from Dave's standpoint um, has a really good handle on it. Um, our clients that use Janine have also had, a, you know, I think really good luck. So I think just trying to work and continue to communicate with your payroll companies on those loans or not loans, on those um, credits that are out there, as well as the deferral of payroll taxes that are available, as well as the paid sick leave that, that has to all be reported through the payroll, that's really um, gonna be essential in this. But, you know, really kind of last, I mean, the last thing on the payroll taxes is that if you did receive PPP money, um, you're not eligible for some of those payroll deferrals. So you have to, again, work hand in hand. It's not just informing the payroll company that you want to defer. It's also, there are other factors that fall into place with that. So just communicate with your accountant, communicate with your payroll company, and just make sure that you're taking advantage of everything that's out there from a cash flow standpoint. Um, Kristen, one other thing to throw in real quick too. New York State did sneak into the budget a requirement yep. to provide sick leave that's gonna outlast all of this coronavirus stuff. And that rule will go into effect the end of September and people will begin to be able to take time in January. So I think there's more guidance coming on that, but folks should be aware of that in, in, the, in the blur of all the COVID-19 stuff, that's, that's still gonna be out there, so. Yeah, and I, I do agree. There's going to be a handful of legislation that's still going to come out between now and the end of the year. You know, there's pending legislation on whether or not to extend the unemployment, the $600 a week for unemployment. There's pending legislation that relates to the deductibility of expenses on corporate tax returns. So right now, um, the, the Treasury ruling that came out was if you apply for forgiveness and you have, you, you know, all of the payroll expenses and rent expenses and the expenses that you're using to qualify for the forgiveness piece of the PPP, those are now not deductible from an income tax standpoint. Um, that's not really the intention of the law. The intention of the law was to allow for double dipping. So um, I know it totally goes against the government, but that was really the intention. So they say they're gonna deal with it between now and the end of the year. I don't know if, if and when that will come out, but that is definitely on the table. Um, and there are other, you know, HR and, and employee related, you know, things that are going to come out. And I know the questions we get are, you know, well, if somebody's not comfortable coming back to work, then you, sh you should allow them to continue to work from home. But now the question is, well, how, for how long, right? If you really need somebody in your office, when, when can you not allow them to do that? So, or when do you move on and, and part ways? So I think there's going to be a, a whole lot of more guidance that has to come out. And it's you know going to go hand in hand with you know what the what the rules and regulations are and the size of your company and whether or not you can say I'm exempt from all of that because I've got five people in my office and I need all five there. So you know that you really kind of need to pay attention and talk to your you know an HR director, your payroll company, and and your accountant all in the same conversation. And then you know kind of. Last in all of this, and then we'll kind of take some questions from people, but, you know, my biggest concern, you know, as running an outsourced accounting division and, you know, concern I had even from the get-go was, you know, what, if, what happened to your internal controls during all of this, right? So what, and, and how do you go about dealing with internal controls with a remote finance department? or with the remote office, right? You used to have maybe three people in the office and maybe an, an 
administrative person went and opened the mail and then handed the, the checks to a receivable you know, person or to at least the owner, even if it wasn't fully a full finance department. And now, you know, you, you're sending one person to the mailbox to get the mail. You're, you've got another person just, you know, opening the mail, writing a deposit, putting checks in. There's really um, not as much oversight as there used to be, right? Because you don't have those multiple people in the office. Everybody's now working very independently. Even if you're talking over teams, that's not necessarily fulfilling an internal control policy. So you really need to kind of go back to square one and say, okay, you know, how do we reinstate some internal controls and some better policies if we're going to continue to work from, from home? Because other owners are saying, well, hey, I used to be able to do everything, but now I really need to focus on revenue generating activities, right? So if they didn't, if they were doing their accounting on their own, now they're saying, what can I get rid of so that I can go out and generate some more revenue and I need that square footage that I used to have overhead people in, my administrative staff, my accounting staff, or you know, even to some degree an HR staff. And I need that space now so that I can have 50% of my people in my building or I can have my people back in the building that generate revenues for us that will keep us afloat. But if you, you know, move all those people off-site or back remotely again, now you have to go back to, well, what are the internal controls going to be? So we really kind of want to just make people aware of, if you continue that, you know, if you consider outsourcing or you consider keeping your staff remote, just keep in mind of what those controls are so that you don't leave your company open to, you know, theft or any other misappropriation of funds during this time because everybody needs every little piece that they can get. So, um, you know, that's, that's really everything I had to, to discuss. I don't know if anybody has any questions, feel free to put it in the group chat. I don't know if you want to unmute people. Yeah, I will uh, unmute some people right now. Um, we can go over maybe some of the most common questions you guys receive, especially during this time. Sure. So, Jim, there was something when you were talking, trying to go back through my, I wrote a couple things down when you were talking. Okay. I know that, mm -hmm. um, Can I find it? We, we talked, when we were talking the other day, you brought up a, a point on the comfort, right? The feeling I, I said, like some of the questions I have of, of, you know, how do you get your employees to feel comfortable? How do you get your employees? Like, you know, how do you have those conversations and start those conversations with people? And when, when is there like what is that line before they cross of now i'm just abusing and i don't want to go back to work right and i'm just saying to people i don't feel comfortable because i want to stay home for the summer with my kids right <laughs> like where is that what is that line that you think you should draw well i i think the first thing is while you're dealing with folks on an individual basis you've got to look across your entire organization because you cannot If, you're, if you enter into individual negotiations with every single employee, somewhere along the way, somebody's going to accuse you of having played favorites. Oh, well, you let them stay out longer than I did. You told me I had to come back sooner, and I've got more problems than they do. And, and, and then you're dealing with all kinds of, um, I, I'll call it soap operas. So, you know, find out what your folks are concerned about. But this is why communication is so critical. You know, um, my wife works for a bank, all right? Some of her tellers are very, very, you know, they've, they've been working right along, but they've only had to work through the drive through Well, you know, we've got, we've got appropriate per PPEs in place. We've got all the plexiglass barriers are up, and they wouldn't open their lobbies until all the plexiglass barriers were up. So communicate with folks that, hey, look, we've got more protections at work than you have when you go to the grocery store. All right. 
You're, you're not walking around with a plexiglass shield keeping you away from everybody else in the grocery store or, you know, how many of you have been to a restaurant now, even if you're sitting outdoors, all right, there's, you know, you're still around other people. So it, it's got to be a logical process and you've got to be as consistent as possible between employees. Um, but you also have to be attentive and listen. You know, there's those six delineated reasons under the Family First uh, Coronavirus uh, Act, reasons why people don't have to come to work, you know, subject to a quarantine order, getting testing, loss of childcare or school, you know, caring for others and so on. That's why those individual conversations are important. But sooner or later, you have to say, hey, look, this is what we need from everybody. This is a team effort and we need everybody in by this date or we have to start making other arrangements. So, um, so it's, it's a combination of listening, but it's sooner or later, you've got to put, your, um, put a stake in the ground and be consistent about what you're telling everybody and about what you're expecting from everybody. How's that for a non-answer? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Doesn't look like, does anybody else uh, have any questions? Doesn't look like we have any other questions from the audience. Um, do you guys have, you know, maybe your top two questions you hear pretty frequently from um, your clients? You wanna start, Kristen? I know, like for me, um when everything started and everybody um, went remote was, um, how am I supposed to pay my bills, <laughs> right? Without having, you know, my accounting software was on, a, on my network and, you know, we don't necessarily want that to be available, you know, or they didn't want it to be available. So it was only on certain, you know, desktops. So um, I've had a lot of uh, consultations with clients on how to have a, um, how to have an accounting process that's cloud-based, right? How to move to the cloud, how to be able to offer bill pay services, how to offer, um, one of the big things we're working through now with, with a client is time and attendance, right? We have a client that didn't have time and attendance. They didn't use their phones. They actually, when they came in, logged into a computer. Well, now as they're reopening, they can't congregate in the, open, in the you know, entrance way so that they can log in when they come in. So it will be key to implement time and attendance in the next few weeks or so before they can open their doors. So, you know, it's really kind of working with them on how can we move people apart, but still be able to offer the security and still be able to offer the, um, the socially distancing, but still have the controls in place, right? So, that's kind of, you know, before maybe you had two people that always touched the deposit. Now we don't have that anymore because there's only one person in the office. So it's just working through each of the individual circumstances with clients to make sure that they can do what they can to keep their finances secure. Mm. That's great. And Jim, do you have a typical one or two questions that you receive? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a couple, you know, most of the questions that I get right now are, somebody just said they have a sore throat. How long do we have to keep them out of work? Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to call and say, is a hangnail a COVID-19 symptom? I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, and, and there, are, there are rules and regulations out there. You know, if somebody's presenting with COVID-19 symptoms, you know, they have to self-isolate for 10 days, if somebody was exposed to somebody with COVID-19, they have to isolate for 14 days. And there's a lot of stuff published on the state site um, and some of these rules are changing as they learn more. Um, so we're helping folks with a lot of that. The other thing that um, I'm starting to see are, you know, employees have been working remote for several months now. Their companies are talking about them, you know, returning to the office and employees that during this time had scheduled vacation are now saying, well, can I push my vacation into the fall? And companies are saying, well, wait a minute, we have other people that were already told they could take their vacation in the fall. We don't have enough staff to cover everybody if you're all out on vacation at the same time. Um, so it's anticipating some of those kinds of questions and being prepared because it's, it's happening in a lot of places. A lot of folks are saying, well, geez, I, I was home this whole time. I, you know, I, don't, I wanna take my vacation later. And, and they're probably not gonna be allowed to do it, but that's, uh, that's a company decision. And again, mm -hmm. they're gonna have to come up with a consistent response 
um, so that everybody's treated the same way and gets the same answer for the same reason. So. Now I have a quick question for you. Um, I was just going to say, Alyssa, to, to piggyback off of that, Jim, some of the things we've been doing are cash flow projections, right? Specifically for our mm -hmm. clients for that reason is because if people can't take vacation because now they're really busy and they don't have a use it or lose it policy and now they have to pay them out at the end of the year, well, what is that going to cost them? And so in the communication to the, to the, the staff or the, their employees, they need to figure out, you know, what is that cost to the company? Can the company actually afford that cost going forward? But because they really need their, their people to come to work to be able to rebound as best they can. So I'm, that was, sorry, Alyssa. No, 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 you're good. I'm, gl I'm glad you added that. <laughs> Didn't even think about it from the angle. So I'm glad you added that. Um, now, my quick question, um, as companies are returning back to work and some are even starting the in-person meetings, um, now would you suggest, Jim, to have those companies, anybody who's coming into the facility who is not staff member, to have them sign some type of acknowledge or some type of document to sign to have those meetings? <laughs> Um, I would not, um, I, I know some places are doing temperature testing and, and those kinds of things and, and maybe that's okay. Um, there is a, I believe it's a New York state law. I don't think it's a federal law. I'm pretty certain it's New York state where companies can require that before you enter the building, you have proper PPE in place, face masks and, and all that kind of thing or we don't have to let you on the premises. Wow. Okay, so it has to be on and it has to be worn properly. So I, I talk about my wife who works for a bank. Um, first of all, just, just think about this. People with masks can now come into banks and you can't see anything. Um, not, not exactly making everybody comfortable there, but um, businesses can require that you enter with PPE or they can tell you, you you're not allowed to enter the building. And that is, that is New York state law. Mm -hmm. So um, employees have to be, um, have to be prepared for that. And management should sit with employees and go through what I call scripting. So you don't just tell people, get out, get out. <laughs> but, you know, Sir, we're in compliance with New York state law around social distancing and disease prevention. Um, we're required to require you to have personal protective equipment on. And if you don't, we're not allowed to serve you today. Uh, it's kind of like no shoes, no shirt, no mask, no service. Right. So, um, awesome. Well, if there aren't any questions. Um, there's two actually, well, there's one anyway. It was Dave commenting on the, our great insights and thank you for taking the time. Awesome. I've got a question from Janine though. How do you suggest employers address the common symptom questions for example, having a stomach ache possible since the COVID. Well, so Janine's question is, how do you suggest employers address the common symptom questions? For an example, if having a stomach ache is a possible symptom of COVID, how do you suggest employers address employees from claiming they have a stomach ache every day? Um, in your sickness policy, in your, in your attendance policy, um, a lot of companies will say, hey, look, it's going to reach a point where if you're calling in sick too often, um, and, I, and I couch all of this with the new New York State sick rules that will be coming out, um, if something's happening too frequently, um, get employees to bring a doctor's note. Um, get them to get a doctor's note that says, hey, you're either, you're either out and, and your doctor says so, or you're cleared to return to work. Um, we've also had people come to us and say, hey, the employee says they're having trouble getting testing, which I find hard to believe anymore with all the drive up testing sites. Um, but have them go to their doctor and have them doctors have their doctors say, you know, dear employer, this employee is safe to return to work doesn't have to have a diagnosis on it, just a doctor's note. It makes the employee go through the exercise It lets them know that you're serious about um, protecting your workplace and being consistent with your policy. Um, one of the things that I, uh, I, I share with a lot of managers when they have an employee who's using, the, it's the stomach ache today, it's the car that wouldn't start tomorrow, it's the, it's the great grandmother twice removed and you know, through adoption uh, that's, that's ill and 
I can't come to work for that. Um, if you want to have some fun, uh, go out to um, go out to the internet, type in mail call um, Colonel Blake and uh, and Klinger, and there's an interesting piece where Klinger comes in and says to Colonel Blake, "Hey, if you remember, and I'm I'm old enough to remember the old Mash TV series and." Klinger comes in and says, oh, my father's dying. Colonel Blake opens up a file and says, father dying, huh? Let's see. Father dying last year. Mother dying last year. Father and mother dying. Here's one. Sister dying, mother pregnant. Mother, we have mother dying and sister pregnant. Klinger, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Basically, it's just excuse after excuse after excuse. So have a consistent attendance policy. Have in there that, you know, after so many days out or, or so many call offs that we can request a doctor's note um, and, and then administer those things um, consistently. If you've hired people, then you need them to help run your business. And if they're not showing up, they're not helping you run your business. I can share a story that I have a friend of mine that runs a warehouse, right? He's the plant manager, basically. He had an employee who, in essence, wanted a sick day and decided he would just call in sick and tell people that he had a fever and it shut down the entire plant for the day. They gave him a COVID test, they did all this, and at the end of the day, the guy felt really guilty and basically said, I made up the whole story so I could take a day off, right? So you need to kind of also, right, express to the employees, what, what are the consequences? Like, you know, if you need a day, take a mental health day, but don't lie about being sick, right? Because that has huge ramifications. It's almost like, you know, calling a bomb scare or something, right? In a school at this point. Like the last thing you want to do is to create more urgency and create this dire, you know, situation for the company right we have 100 people plus in our building right so if somebody gets sick like that's going to have huge ramifications for everybody else that's there so you know work with your employees explain to them what happens if if somebody is sick so they can feel comfortable that there are systems in place but you know we talked to him at the end of that day and he was like oh man you should hear about this day i just had right and it was it was you know not something you want to go through but you want to make sure that you, you know, if you're working with those hourly rate employees and the ones that, you know, need to be at work, but then don't necessarily have a lot of, you know, save time, you really have to express the importance of, you know, the old call in sick to work day is not the same as it used to be. So, you know, that's, that's an important message too to some of them. So, Janine is asking a question. Um, what daily questions are required by employers to ask employees before they come to work regarding COVID? Janine, we, we make everybody do a survey every day before they can come in. I'm sure that I can get a copy and probably share it with you, but Jim, you could probably. Yeah, that, that's, that's, what, that's what a lot of folks are doing. It's all part of the safety plans that are, that are going into place. And you know, a lot of places are doing the uh, temperature testing. Um, there's some uh, local companies that are providing those thermometers out there. If anyone needs some referrals, we can certainly take care of that too. Um, but yeah, it's just got to be careful. But again, when you're taking those surveys, protect you know the confidentiality, you know, but keep them on file. So. Perfect. All right. Well, I. We have about 10 minutes left, um, but does anybody else have uh, one final question? Well, I want to take some time and just say thank you so much to the both of you and shining a light on these topics. I know we've had a lot of members ask questions um, so it's also it's awesome to know that they have people to go to to ask these questions and thank you so much for your time. All right, well, thank you and, and Kristen, great working with you on this. Alyssa, thanks for setting all this up. Of course. Yes. We have thank you, Alyssa, and thank you, Jim. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.